Hello everyone, welcome to part two of this three-part series on Taiwan's political parties. Today, we'll be looking at the history, the leadership, and the policies of Taiwan's ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party. So, without further ado, let's get into it. As mentioned in part one, the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, originates from the Danwai, or Outside the KMT, movement, which formed in opposition to the Kuomintang's one-party authoritarian rule under the party-state system. While the formation of this party in September 1986 was illegal, the KMT did not crack down on it, and members of the newly formed party went on to win about 10% of the seats in the ROC's legislative yuan that year, sitting as independents, and in the election of December 1989, the first in which opposition groups could contest seats as organised political parties, the DPP won one-fifth of the seats. The factions that existed within the Danwai movement continued into the DPP. These factions included the New Tide faction, which was centrist and the largest faction of the DPP. It consisted of intellectuals and social activists led by Wu Nai Ren and Chou Yi Zhen, who went on to take up major government roles in the 2000s. It advocated for social democracy, attempting to work with other labour and social movements to influence public policy. As the New Tide lacked well-known political names at the national level, the faction utilised its strong organisation to alternatively threaten or cajole DPP members aspiring to higher office into alliances or cooperation. Regardless of whether or not they were at odds with the New Tide when running for chairmanship, successive DPP chairmen often appointed large numbers of New Tide members to the positions of party secretary general or party manager, resulting in a mutually beneficial relationship with the New Tide. Another faction included the Kang Group, which was a moderate faction led by Kang Ningxiang, a leading figure in the opposition movement throughout the 1970s and 1980s. Kang was described by the New York Times in 1978 as the most successful and astute of the opposition, and is seen as a moderate member of the Democratic Progressive Party. He told the Times in 1988 that an independent Taiwan was an idea worthy of discussion. Kang met with Chinese politicians at the Democratic National Convention in the United States later that year and made his opposition to the one country, two systems formula known. He believes that improvement in cross-strait relations should not cost Taiwan its path to democratization. The third faction was led by Lin Zhangjie. It was called the Progress Faction and was opposed to Taiwanese independence. Despite not succeeding in a number of elections, the DPP's presence put pressure on the KMT and led to a number of reforms in the 1990s, such as the direct popular election of the Republic of China's president and all representatives in the National Assembly and Legislative Yuan, as well as the creation of a more open culture in terms of speaking about past events, such as the February 28 incident. Despite their lack of electoral success in the 1990s, the DPP had raised their profile enough to win the 2000 presidential election, with the election of Chen Shui-bian. The result, however, was only a plurality of the vote, as the pan-blue, meaning pro-reunification vote, was split between the KMT and independent candidate James Song. The election of a DPP president marked the first time in 91 years that the KMT was not in power in the Republic of China. Due to the Pan Blue Coalition retaining control of the legislature, Chen Shui-bian decided to abandon some of his campaign promises, moving away from some of his centrist positions. Chen had initially planned a referendum on introducing a new constitution, but this was prevented by the legislature. He was able to be narrowly re-elected in 2004. Chen continued with a more fundamentalist approach, leading to losses in the 2005 local and county elections. During these elections, KMT party chairman Ma Ying Zhou's popularity rose, and eventually in the 2008 presidential election, Ma Ying Zhou defeated the DPP's candidate, former Premier Frank Xie, leading to eight years of the KMT rule. As a result of their defeat, Xie was replaced by the more moderate Tsai Ing-wen in May 2008. Many members of Chen's administration were investigated for corruption, such as Ye Sheng Mao, 
former Director General of the Ministry of Justice's Investigation Bureau, who was sentenced to 10 years in prison. In combined elections in 2012, the DPP failed to win the presidency nor secure a majority in the legislative yuan. Two years later, however, the Sunflower Movement, which was discussed in my previous video about the KMT, massively changed the mood of the electorate, despite the KMT deciding not to ratify the cross-strait service trade agreement. This led to the re-election of the DPP to the presidency in 2016 in the form of President Tsai Ing-wen, as well as obtaining a clear majority in the legislature. As a result of the DPP's poor performance in the 2018 local elections caused by poor decision-making and weak candidates, Tsai Ing-wen stepped down as the party chairman but retained her position as president. The chairman position was taken by Zhou Jiang Tai. Despite the DPP's 2018 loss, Tsai's strong response against Beijing's proposals for a one-country, two-systems model for Taiwan, as well as the huge impact of the crackdown on political freedoms in Hong Kong, led to a major win for the DPP in the January 2020 presidential election, the result of which was the DPP winning 57% of the vote and Han Kuo Yu, the KMT challenger, winning only 38%. So let's talk about the leaders of the DPP. Well, I say leaders, but Tsai Ing-wen is in fact now both the president of Taiwan and the chairwoman of the DPP. Tsai grew up in Taipei and received a bachelor's degree in 1978, master's degree in 1980, and PhD in law in 1984 from the National Taiwan University, Cornell University Law School, and the London School of Economics, respectively. After teaching law in Taiwan, she was appointed to the Fair Trade Commission and the Copyright Commission, as well as serving as consultant for the Mainland Affairs Council and the National Security Council. She also led the drafting team on the statute governing relations with Hong Kong and Macau. Tsai began her political career in 2000, becoming chair of the Mainland Affairs Council, a prestigious post, before joining the DPP in 2004. While serving as chairwoman of the Consumer Protection Commission, Tsai was appointed to the post of Vice President of the Executive Yuan, a position also known as the Vice Premier. In 2008, Tsai went on to win the DPP leadership, defeating Ku Kuang-ming and becoming the first female leader of a major Taiwanese party. During Ma Ying-jeou's presidency, Tsai often criticised Ma's stance on Taiwan's sovereignty, to which he labelled her a Taiwan independence extremist. Despite retaining her position as DPP leader in 2012, she resigned her position after she lost in the 2012 presidential election against incumbent Ma Ying-jeou. The Sunflower Movement gave Tsai the opportunity to run for and take back her position as DPP leader after her rivals, Su Tseng Chang and Frank Tsie, dropped out in the aftermath of the movement. Being at the helm of the party in 2014 was beneficial to Tsai, as the Sunflower Movement gave the DPP a massive boost in the 2014 local elections, carrying them to an historic win in the 2016 presidential elections, where Tsai won with 56% of the votes, with Eric Chu, the KMT candidate, winning only 37%. As mentioned previously, despite a poor showing in the 2018 local elections, Tsai was able to get re-elected in 2020 with 58% of the vote to the KMT's Han Kuo Yu's 38.6% due to Beijing's hostility to Taiwan and due to the political crackdown in Hong Kong. Tsai once again benefited from good timing and mainland Chinese pressure. So what did the DPP actually stand for? Well, it must first be said that the current official position of the party is that Taiwan is an independent and sovereign country whose territory consists of Taiwan and its surrounding smaller islands, and whose sovereignty derives only from the ROC citizens living in Taiwan, based on the 1999 Resolution on Taiwan's Future. It considers Taiwan as an independent nation under the name of the Republic of China, making a formal declaration of independence unnecessary. In this way, the DPP sidesteps the independence discussion. They are more comfortable with the idea of a Taiwanese national identity than the KMT are, short of outright declaring Taiwan's independence. The DPP also claims to want to make as many international connections for Taiwan as possible, and to strengthen the bonds it already has, especially with its very few official diplomatic allies. 
We can see this most recently with the Lithuania-China spat, in which Lithuania allowed Taiwan to name its office in Lithuania the Taiwan Representative Office, rather than the Taipei Representative Office. The reason for this warming in relations was due to Taiwan donating 100,000 face masks to the country in early 2020, to which Lithuania returned the favour by donating 20,000 vaccines to Taiwan in 2021. This is representative of the DPP's attempts to strengthen Taiwan as an international player. This can also be seen in Taiwan's new southbound policy that aims to enhance cooperation and exchange between Taiwan and 18 countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia and Oceania. The policy seeks to cooperate in the areas of trade, technology, agriculture, tourism, education and medicine, with the creation of new trade offices in these countries, as well as new information services for Taiwanese businesses investing in these countries, among other things, with the slogan for the program being Taiwan Helps Asia and Asia Helps Taiwan, which has been pushed by President Tsai. It should also be noted that under the DPP, same-sex marriage was also legalized, making Taiwan the first country in Asia to allow same-sex couples to be married there. As a side note, while Israel does recognize same-sex married couples, they cannot get married there. The DPP seems to want to walk a line between declaring outright independence and accepting the 1992 consensus, which it strongly rejects. This will be harder for them as they seek to expand Taiwan's international significance, as further moves will be sure to anger China. The fact that they are making these moves, however, demonstrates that the DPP leadership believes China to be a paper tiger. China's clampdown in Hong Kong surely strengthened the DPP's position. But whether the DPP can ride this wave through the 2024 presidential election is to be seen. But if they are to succeed, they cannot rely on this alone. Thank you for listening to part two of this three-part series. In the next episode, I'll be discussing Taiwan's minor parties, including the Taiwan People's Party, the New Power Party, and the People's First Party, among many others. Bye-bye for now, and I'll see you on the next one.